joining this session on um, Arctic oil spill modeling. Uh, so as I said, this is a joint session between the physical oceanography and the modeling teams. And uh, so the physical oceanography team was established in 2020 as a self-formed team, and it has now become an official collaboration team. It's co-led led by Dimitri and uh, Zhu Jing, who are on the, the call as well. And it aims at connecting uh, physical oceanographers, scientists, and stakeholders that have a focus on the Arctic all across the interagency uh, spectrum, and also with uh, international collaborators. The modeling subteam focuses on Earth system integration and prediction through a hierarchy of modeling tools. Um, again, it aims at connecting Earth system models across the interagency landscape for enhanced collaboration and coordination of, uh, of efforts. And this is uh, co-led by Richard Collater, who's on the call too, and uh, by Reno Joseph as well. Um, I'd like to uh, hand it over to, um, to Hazel for a couple of minutes uh, to talk about the new uh, Arctic Research Plan 2022 to 2026. Okay, can you see those slides? Yes, we can. Perfect, thank you, Wilbert. Yeah, so um, just wanted to take a minute before we get started. For those of you that are familiar with our IARPIC, um, this will um, be sort of a, a familiar topic. And for those of you that are new, welcome, and we welcome you to engage in this process as well. So IARPIC has been over the last maybe year plus, um, IARPIC has been working on developing a new Arctic research plan. So we operate under five year cycles of uh, federal Arctic research plans. And this new Arctic research plan provides a bold vision for federal agencies to nimbly and collaboratively help understand and support resilience in the face of the dramatic changes that are occurring in the Arctic. Um, and so it is actually quite different than uh, the previous plan. And this is um, a picture of the report cover and it represents sort of the more holistic approach that this um, report is taking thanks to artist Molly Trainer um, for the illustration and designer, graphic designer Eric Klein for the um, overall layout. So this plan, if you took part in the plan development process, this will look familiar to you, though it has been updated since the plan was released in December. Um, the top section shows the four policy drivers. Um, and so you'll see that well-being, stewardship, security, and Arctic to global systems. And that's where Arctic research directly supports US policy. And in the center, you'll see um, those, those four policy drivers too are carried over from the last plan. And then what's new is that you'll see these four priority areas, which I'll go over um, in slightly more detail here. Um, and I, yeah, I guess I won't read through that. And then um, underlying that, there are five foundational activities that are supporting all of the four priority areas. And... Um, as we recognize that the Arctic is changing at an unprecedented pace. And so while this five-year planning cycle has allowed us to add in many emerging topics in the Arctic, we want to be even more nimble than that. So we're working in this cycle of two-year implementation plans. And so right now, um, January through March, we're gathering ideas of what are the big topics that we really need to tackle within the next two years. And so, um, this presentation today is really inviting you to share those ideas and maybe Meredith, you could drop a link into the chat um, where folks can enter those ideas um, to be considered by the biennial implementation plan um, drafting teams. And so here you'll see the timeline and uh, just to highlight again in this January to March phase, we are welcoming public input um, and then federal teams will write the biennial implementation plan and it will be released in September. Um, I'm going to skip this side. It's just a differentiation between what an objective and a deliverable is. But if you have an idea, don't worry about that. Just let us know what you think is important. Um, the four priority areas, I'll go through this really quickly. But uh, the first one is community resilience and health. And we're aiming to improve community resilience and well-being by strengthening research and developing tools to increase understandings of interdependent social, natural, and built systems in the Arctic. Uh, the second one is priority area two, which if you've been involved with IARPIC, many of the um, 
sort of natural science activities will fall into this priority area to Arctic system interactions bucket. Priority area three is sustainable economies and livelihood. Um, and we'll be aiming to observe and understand the Arctic's natural, social, and built systems to promote sustainable economies and livelihoods. And then just very briefly, four is focused on risk management and hazard mitigation. And so if you have an idea to suggest, um, making a, a clear tie to one of these four priority areas um, is really the best way to get your idea into the implementation plan. Oh. Uh, it looks like I skipped the slide unintentionally with the five foundational acti activities outlined. Um, and But you can refer to the website for that information. And I just did want to highlight that this one is probably most relevant, um, especially to the modeling folks on this call. So this um, monitoring, observing, modeling, and prediction foundational activity. And there's um, a couple of directions that the drafting team is considering for that. And so if you have input there, please let us know. Um, Meredith, anything that I missed or anything else that, um, any questions that people have? I will just add that I'm dropping one more link into the chat and that is um, an informational session we're holding on February 15th where there will be um, more detail about this, um, the Ar Arctic Research Plan and the biennial implementation um, process. Great, thanks. I recognize that was really quick, especially if you haven't been involved in the plan process, um, but please do put questions in the chat or I can drop my email in there. And if you have more questions, um, let me know. And with that, I'll pass it back to Wilbur. And um, I know we have a full agenda today. So thanks very much, Hazel. This was very useful, I think, uh, to give people an overview of what is, uh, what is going on in IARPIC land. Um, so today we'll be talking about oil spill response and remediation. Um, it's obviously a challenging task everywhere, uh, but no more so than in the Arctic. Um, modeling plays a critical role in predicting the pathways and dispersion of oil spills. And um, in this webinar, we will hear from two teams that develop and apply capability in the area of oil spill modeling in the Arctic. And uh, hopefully we'll have some time to discuss the role of interagency and international coordination and collaboration on that as well. Um, I think this team is relevant to priority area number four uh, that um, uh, Hazel just uh, presented on risk management and uh, hazard mit mitigation. So we'll start with the presentation by Amy McFadden. She is an oceanographer in um, the OR and NR's oil spill response program uh, at, uh, at NOAA. She's got a physical a PhD in physical oceanography from the University of Washington. Um, and she participated in the international collaboration in the response to the Jap Japan tsunami marine debris event. And she's currently project manager for the GNOME oil spill modeling suite. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to Amy. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for the introduction. I'm gonna try to share my screen now. Hopefully I can make this work properly. Okay, so um, if that worked well, you're looking at a lovely picture of Arctic sea ice. Um, <laughs> let me just get my slides up in front of me so I can see. Yeah, this picture, um, so my, my research has never really been focused specifically on the, on the Arctic. Um, it was, you know, physical oceanography of the Pacific Northwest coastal, coastal zone initially, and then more recently with NOAA oil spill response modeling, both as a practitioner of um, using models for response as well as developing models. Uh, but I did have the good fortune to travel uh, some years ago to Barrow, Alaska and Wainwright um, to, in a workshop that was focused on um, trying to incorporate traditional ecological knowledge into response planning. And it was just an absolutely fascinating experience. I got to hear, um, you know, really engage with some of the um, local um, indigenous people and learn some of their, you know, some of their experiences and concerns about um, oil spill response specifically um, in the Arctic. Um, and so I just thought I would share that as a start as we're looking at this wonderful picture um, of the ice edge off of Barrow, the landfast ice. 
I, I just want to acknowledge my uh, colleague, Chris Barker, who's also on the call. Um, Chris and I pretty much together lead the, the GNOME development. Um, you know, so detailed algorithmic questions, I will probably defer, uh, defer to Chris, um, <laughs> but I'm gonna hope to hopefully give a general overview of, of our oil spill response modeling program, um, and then try to highlight some challenges unique to the Arctic. I'm not gonna get um, too into detail on the specific um, oil and ice modeling interactions because I think Tor is gonna cover that um, after after my um, talk. So this will be more general about um, oil spill modeling and response, and specifically focused on response modeling. I, I do have just a brief outline of what I'm gonna go over. I thought I would start with just um, a really quick overview of the um, kind of US within the United States, the oil spill response framework that we work under, just to kind of show how NOAA and my office fit into that framework. Um, and then, as I said, some basics of oil spill modeling, different applications for oil spill models and approaches um, that we might take for those applications. And I will go over briefly the um, physical processes that are, are typically modeled in, in, oil spill, uh, in oil spill models in general. And then, as I said, I'll speak more specifically to response modeling considerations and challenges particular to the Arctic. So yeah, as I said, I was gonna start with just a very brief overview. Um, this is my most boring slide and I'm sorry, I'm not gonna to spend too long, long on it, but I think it is um, you know, uh, informative to think about the framework that we work under. Um, so within the um, United States, we have the National Oil and Hazardous Substances Pollution Contingency Plan, which we call the NCP for short, because that's uh, way too much of a mouthful. So the National Contingency Plan basically establishes this national response system, which is the federal government's response management system for emergency response to releases of hazardous substances into the environment. Um, so this includes um, discharges of oil into coastal waters. Basically, when a spill occurs, the organization responsible for the spill is required by law to notify the National Response Center. They, in turn, notify a designated on-scene coordinator uh, these are federal officials pre-designated by either the EPA or the U.S. Coast, Coast Guard. Um, in the case of spills in marine or navigable waterways, it's generally the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, so that the on-scene coordinator then coordinates with the state and local agencies to determine if federal involvement is necessary and then deploys the appropriate resources. If the spill warrants it, they'll form a unified command with state and local agencies. And then the responsible party, the spiller of the oil in this case, is also a part uh, invited to be a part of that unified command so they can really be working together to uh, respond to the oil spill to try to mitigate the damage. So this is finally where, where NOAA comes in. So they may, the, the unified command can request technical support from these special federal teams that are um, this list on the, um, lower right side of this flow chart. Um, so the different special forces teams that are called out in the national contingency plan are there, including down the second one from the bottom, NOAA scientific support coordinators. So our office, um, the Office of Response and Restoration within NOAA, um, in our emergency response division, we have a group of scientific support coordinators who are regionally based and uh, if a spill occurs in their, in their area, they then um, are that input to the, to the on-scene um, coordinator and they reach back basically to us in Seattle for, for information um, on whatever the, the questions at hand may be. Um, the other part of this flowchart on the left, it just calls out the national response team and the regional response teams. These are um, representatives from various federal agencies that have expertise in various aspects of preparedness and response. Um, they're typically more involved in, in planning and policy guidance prior to a spill, but they can provide support um, to, the, to the unified command if asked. So drilling down from there um, to NOAA's various roles in oil spill response. Um, so as shown in those kind of special teams in direct input to the unified command in the areas of scientific and technical support. So that might be questions about the physical properties of the oil, its chemistry, its toxicity, where is the oil going to go, what resources are in the area, um, shoreline assessment techniques for, um, for surveying the oil and making recommendations on, on cleanup. So that's the one, one big role that our office plays in um, oil spill response. 
And then under various uh, laws, such as the Oil Pollution Act, Clean Water Act, CERCLA and others, um, NOAA is also identified as a natural resource trustee for the public's natural resources. So there's roles associated with that national trustee role. And that includes in the aftermath of a spill, the natural resource damage assessment and restoration. So determining the impact of the spill, actually putting a uh, monetary value on the damage and using that money towards restoration projects. And then the final role I've called out there is, um, you know, NOAA is the Department of Commerce representative to those national response team and regional response teams. Um, so that has that, has a, you know, in, before a spill, the planning policy and coordination role. So I'm going to dive more into oil spill modeling now as promised, um, but uh, this kind of illustrates three different areas where we might use oil spill modeling um, to support oil spill response. So during a spill in that scientific technical support role, um, you know, doing emergency response trajectories, for example, and then in the national resource trustee role, um, modeling can be used to help look at the damage assessment, the impact of a spill in the aftermath of a spill. So hindcast modeling and then planning and finally planning and preparedness activities. Also uh, modeling can provide support for that as well. So these three different applications, I've kind of spelled them out in more detail here um, to make the point that these different applications, planning, emergency response, damage assessment require different modeling approaches as they're generally asking very different questions and have very different constraints in terms of the timeline in which information is needed and the information available to input into an oil spill model. So for planning and drills, we're trying to run um, uh, models to capture what, what might be most likely to happen, or, or if not most likely, what is the worst that can happen? Um, you know, you might wanna answer both of those questions because there may be particular sensitive resources in an area that you're most concerned about. So you wanna know what, what is the probability of impacting those resources. So we're asking questions like, where might the oils end up given a spill from a certain location and, and how much time do we have to respond so you can develop response plans. And then emergency response um, here, you know, we're trying to figure out what's what's going to happen now and or, or tomorrow so we can immediately take action and try to mitigate damage to a spill. So where is the bulk of the oil go going to go and when will it get there are the kind of the key questions. And then damage assessment. Um, so that's in the aftermath of a spill, um, you know, a more perhaps um, holistic modeling approach where you're really trying to get at concentrations that organisms are exposed to and the duration of exposure. Um, so potentially a much more uh, sophisticated um, or complicated modeling um, approach might be needed there. Um, whereas emergency response, we generally have very limited information going in and it's, it's kind of the the timeliest answer we, you know, the best answer we can give in the short time frame to to inform the response. So the the model, the underlying model, regardless of the approach, the underlying mo model that we use um, is the same. It's a model that we develop um, in house, which we call NOME, the General NOAA Operational Modeling Environment, <laughs> is what that acronym stands for. So this is a, a model that's been developed at NOAA um, long before I began in, uh, in about 2009. Uh, so it's, it started in, in 1996, um, was the first iteration of GNOME, and it's been used extensively for spill response since then um, through the late 90s, or I said from the late 90s through the Deepwater Horizon incident um, in 2010 and still to the present. Although since about 2011, following Deepwater Horizon, uh, what the big the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, the GNOME model has undergone some pretty extensive development um, in, the, in the last decade or so. So that includes a new user interface, which is a web-based interface. It's publicly available. Um, the URL is there. And then the computational core of GNOME is a, is a standalone package. It's been separated out, which is, is really useful for some of those more statistical applications that you might use for, for, for planning um, type, type of modeling analysis. So we call that PyNome because it's uh, it has a Python scripting environment to access that computational core, and that is open source on on GitHub and publicly available as well. And we certainly welcome collaboration. Um, I have some the updates that I've listed here are not all relevant to this group, um, 
but the the last one probably algorithms for oil and ice we have we have added um, in recent years some algorithms some simple algorithms for oil ice interactions that uh, we'll get to um, a, a little bit later and in, in, in tourist talk I think. So I did um, because I don't know how familiar um, the audience is with just oil spill modeling in general. I thought it would be useful just to go over um, kind of the general processes that are being modeled um, in, in this is in, in known, but also in, in general in oil spill models because they, they are, are similar in terms of the processes modeled, um, even if they might differ slightly in some of the, some of the algorithms. Uh, but typically we use the Lagrangian particle tracking approach um, for oil spill modeling where the oil is divided up into into particles that move under the influence of currents, either three three dimensionally or just surface. If it's uh, you know we're modeling the movement of a surface slick, and then also a direct uh, wind influence is often used in oil spill models, and, and this is to account for the fact that the oil is basically in a very thin film um, at the interface between air and water. So it's it's kind of like a it's you know a skin layer um, on the surface, and because we tend to measure or predict models within a, uh, you know, about a meter layer at the surface, the oil is moving just right, um, you know, on, on the top. So we, we, we do a, basically a windage parameterization that's generally um, in, in many models, some, somewhere around 3% of the wind speed is added as a direct wind effect with, and it can have a rotation angle um, as well in some models. Um, oil spill models also generally include a random walk um, or, a, or sorry, a random motion, which can be done as a random walk or a random displacement model to account for the turbulent diffusion, which spreads oil and makes it patchy over time. And then on the transport side, we also um, generally have algorithms for um, oil coming ashore um, called beaching and then potential remobilization of oil on the shoreline. The other um, processes we model are, are usually termed weathering. So these are biological, physical, chemical changes that the oil undergoes um, over time once it's spilled in the environment. And these basically change the particle properties, um, the mass, the density, the viscosity of, of the particles change due to these processes. So these include things like evaporation, where the lighter components of the oil are volatile um, and go into the atmosphere. So this is a loss of oil from the from the ocean surface, but of course it um, could be a concern if those um, volatiles are concentrated enough that where people are working um, on the response. We also include dispersion and dissolution. So dispersion is with when oil droplets of various sizes are mixed into the water column. The smaller droplets, um, you know, you. you make a whole mix of droplet sizes but due to wave energy and then those smaller droplets may stay suspended in the water column um, and ultimately dissolve whereas the larger droplets might um, rise quickly and reform a surface slick. Um, so that's included in, in Gnome and other oil spill models. Emulsification is also generally included. Um, the algorithms um, I would say are more um, this is a very active area of algorithm development right now because it's a very hard process to predict. But um, with sufficient mixing energy, water droplets are entrained into the oil. And this is important because it results in really large increases in volume because you might have a, an emulsion with 80% water column, water content. So it can radically increase the volume of material that um, responders are trying to recover. And it also has big impacts on viscosity, making the oil much more, much more viscous, which also can be problematic for response. Sedimentation is another weathering process, or we term it as a weathering process. Um, and this is just interaction with sediments, oil mineral, mineral aggregation, aggregate formation. And then there's potential, you know, in, in really, in waters with a high sediment load that you could um, form sinking oil due to these aggregations. And finally, biodegradation in which hydrocarbons are degraded by microorganisms. So this is a longer term process, but can be a, 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 you know, the ultimate kind of fate of the hydrocarbons and spilled in the environment. And so on the right picture is just kind of an example mass balance that you might get from an oil spill model showing the fraction of the spilled oil that evaporated, dispersed into the water column, 
um, formed aggregates um, beached or um, remains floating on the surface. So I, I just returned to this slide because I, you know, I've been talking very generally about oil spill modeling, but I want to just focus now on, on emergency response modeling more where the goal is really to provide a forecast that can be used to inform decision makers in a really timely manner. So with only the information relevant to the situation at hand, we want good information as quickly and simply as possible. But of course, as an incident initially unfolds, there's often a lot of uncertainty in all the inputs to the oil spill model. So I think it's worthwhile um, to take a quick look at what goes into an oil spill model when producing um, oil fate and transport predictions. So here's um, just to start a, a snapshot of our <laughs> WebNOME model, because often we're talking about, um, you know, our spill model, I get asked, how accurate is it? Uh, or Alternatively, is it as good as so and so's model? Is it as good as you know the model Tor uses a Sintef model? Um, and the answer, of course, is is it depends, right? The unsatisfactory answer, um, but it does really depend. And in particular, when it comes to emergency response, that the spill model is not typically the limiting factor in terms of accuracy, um, because there's so many uncertainties in all the model inputs. Um, so really, the question for emergency response is 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 it useful? Um, does it inform the response with the relevant information that's accurate enough that they can, um, that it could support scientific, supports um, decision, the decision making that needs to be done in order to respond to an incident. Uh, so what are these, I said I was going to talk about the inputs and, and the uncertainty associated with them. The first most obvious input um, is, is what happened. Um, what got spilled? What's the product? And what's the nature of the release? Is it, you know, was it a point in time that it happened very quickly or is it a leaking pipeline? Uh, what's the location? And, and, you know, having worked in emergency response now for, for 10 years, I can tell you that all those things that you, all that information you typically get on the first day is much of it is wrong. Even the location can be off. Um, the, the duration is, is a big one that um, you generally don't know um, because and you know some disaster has happened, whether it's a vessel sinking or a or a pipeline, and and there just isn't a lot of information about the details of of the release, and and that really can make a difference, especially in in really tidally dom dominated waters where the um, currents are changing rapidly. If you release the oil six you know at one time and then six hours later, you could get a very different different result. So that's our first big source of uncertainty in emergency response modeling. Um, we, we also need detailed shoreline in order to um, predict shoreline impacts. Um, in general, that's uh, not a huge issue, but there are parts of the of the U.S. coast that are, um, you know, rapidly changing, like Louisiana, for example, where it can be uh, more problematic to know uh, exactly where the where the shoreline is. Amy, I just. Um... I'm not sure how much further you have to go, but I want to make sure we have time for Tor's presentation. So um, take, a, take a few minutes and, um, but if you could go maybe more quickly through the last piece. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I can wrap up pretty quick. Um, you. you know, I'll just go through the rest of these inputs quickly, just making the point that, you know, all of these, all, all the uncertainties that's, that's going in result to uncertainty in the output. So here's a snapshot of currents. Currents are generally coming from other hydrodynamic models, which have their own uncertainties associated with them. So those are an input to the oil spill model to move the particles, as are winds, which again are coming from uh, usually our partners in the National Weather Service is where we go to for winds, but we all know there's uncertainty in the weather forecast. And the, uh, the last, picture that I have there is just of observations, which can be used to kind of constrain and reduce uncertainty if, if observational data is available, we can use it to validate our inputs. So all of these um, inputs, you can, um, it's probably not too surprising that uh, if things are exacerbated when we come to the Arctic. Um, 
the, you know, so the first few challenges that I've listed here are fairly obvious. Um, accurate prediction relies on regionally focused high resolution models for ice, ocean, and atmosphere. So these would be inputs to the oil spill model, um, which would be not readily available for the Arctic. We also have limited real-time observational environmental data. The observations of oil movement are really important to improve the accuracy of trajectory modeling because we usually don't, as I said, we don't know a lot about the release information. So we, we typically deploy people to fly over the, over the slick through helicopters or drones now increasingly um, to give information about the extent of the oil slick and what it, you know, how it's changing, what it looks like. And that feeds into the model. And it's unlikely that we would get those observations in the Arctic at all at all or not in a timely manner. And so we need to rely solely on satellite analysis, which is, has its own issues with detecting oil in heavier ice con concentrations. There's also in the Arctic, I think a potential need for much longer duration simulations as the response time is gonna be slower to get, um, you know, if it is feasible to respond, getting people there will take longer. And then there's a potential for needing to model over, you know, over a season if the response is not possible during the winter. So predicting what might happen over these longer time frames is a is a big you know a particular challenge, and then finally of course the effect of ice on on oil transport and weathering process. So ice makes a big difference to all of those um, processes that I outlined earlier um, on both the transport and the weathering side. There's impacts, and I'm hoping that Tor is going to go into that since I do not have time. Um, but I will just leave with this slide perhaps that just shows you know that the behavior of oil and ice is very complex. And we certainly don't have to, the ability to model the physics of ice movement and formation on the scales that are really relevant to oil ice interactions. Um, a whole variety of things can occur depending on you know, the ice conditions, the percent coverage um, will be a big factor in how the ice moves. If it's you know, below some threshold, then the ice might just, or the oil might move as it normally would in open water. Whereas if it's above some threshold, the, ice could, the oil could become encapsulated in the ice and move with the ice. Where the oil is spilled is also important, whether it's spilled on top of the oil, ice, under the ice, or into, you know, broken ice um, will, will affect what happens. And then the seasonality is super important as well. If Is the ice freezing in a, in a freeze um, period of time or, or is it thawing? And that's going to make a big difference in the oil, in the oil fate. So I think in the interest of time, I will just stop here because I'm, as I said, I think Tor is going to take up the oil ice interactions topic in more detail. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Amy. That's very, very interesting. Um, I'm sorry we're running a little bit, um, bit late here. Um, so um, if we have some time for questions later, then we'll, uh, we'll get back to you. Um, but let's, uh, yeah, and uh, please ask questions and, and answer questions if you can in the chat. That would probably be, uh, that, that's perfect. And so maybe we'll hand it over to Tor. Thank you very much, Amy. Appreciate that. Not a problem. Really, really, really nice. All right. Can you all see my slide and uh, and hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Perfect. So um, I keep getting messages from Zoom saying that my internet connection is unstable and sometimes the sound drops out for me. So if you can't hear me or if <laughs> then please let me know and I'll try to repeat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so as I said before, uh, my name is Tor Nordam. I work for Sintef Ocean, which is like a non-profit research uh, institute in Norway. And uh, Sintef has been involved with, I mean, Sintef does many things, but uh, there is at least a department that uh, is currently known as uh, the Department for Climate and Environment. And people in this department have been working with different aspects of uh, oil spill research for something like 40 years, I think. Um, yep. So I'm, yeah, I'm a physicist myself. Um, I'm going to talk about, or a computational physicist, and I will talk about um, the modeling of oil spill, uh, oil spills in the Arctic. And uh, my outlook is, is um, a little bit more theoretical, maybe. Um, there is nobody who's going to use. Or I, I'm not going to tell anybody where they have to be in like six hours with the booms. I'm talking. I'm, I'm thinking more about uh, things like risk analysis ahead of time, I guess, and um, yeah, development of models and, and so on. Um, outline of my talk is that I'm going to talk a little bit about background. Then I am going to describe what I think is more or less the current state of the art in uh, oil and ice modeling. 
<laughs> now I'm going to show a few examples of recent work we have been doing at Syntef. Um, I will share some of my thoughts on a couple of challenges that I see with uh, oil and ice uh, uh, modeling. Not necessarily the biggest challenges, but at least two challenges that I, that I have been thinking of. Um, and maybe we have time for some questions uh, at the end. And if you download my slides, which I think will be shared on the internet, then you will find the list of all my references at the very end. So just to open up with this picture, I think uh, certainly in Norway, when people talk about uh, oil spills in ice, this is kind of what people think about. So this is northern Norway right here. Um, Oslo is far to the south outside of the slide. Uh, and these two stars represent what I believe are the two northernmost um, oil developments currently ongoing in Norway. Uh, and this is uh, Svalbard up here, sea ice um, here. This is, I guess, about as far south as the sea ice uh, currently extends. Um, and when people think about oil spills in ice in Norway, I think people imagine uh, kind of a, you get a blowout from some kind of site like this. And... Uh, lots of uh, oil reaches the ice and um, yeah, affects maybe the polar cod or maybe even yeah, people think about polar bears and different things. And yeah, so this is kind of the, the image that we have, I think. Uh, of course, in practice, this kind of thing doesn't happen very often. And much more often when you have oil spills in ice, it's because of a shipping accident or something, uh, something smaller like that. <laughs> but anyway, this is... Um, this kind of picture is one of the reasons I think why oil spills in ice have received a bit of research funding um, in Norway. Yeah. Um, some of what we do know, or I guess, yeah, I mean, some of what we do know from about oil spills uh, in ice, we know from actual accidents that people have observed, and some things we know from experimental oil spills in ice. Uh, however, experimental oil spills in ice, they are rare compared to uh, experimental oil spills in the field without ice. Um, and a lot of these releases, they have been done in high ice cover and they have focused mainly on either how the ice affects the weathering of the oil or how it affects response and recovery. So people test different skimmers or they test in situ burning or things like this. Um, there have been uh, less focus on things like transport, entrainment and the transition from open water to ice. So what happens if you spill a lot of oil in open water and it kind of drifts into the marginalized zone and starts mixing with ice. Um, this is an example of one of those experimental uh, oil spills in the field. This is uh, a field study that was done by Sintef in 2009, so that's before before I joined Sintef. Um, and you can see here uh, there is some oil uh, in between the ice flows here. So this was oil that was spilled in the marginal ice zone in very high ice cover. Uh, and it was tracked for about five days, and they measured winds and currents, and the trajectory was recorded with GPS and so on. Um, oil samples were taken at different times to say something about the weathering and composition of the oil. <coughs> uh, and Stopped. this meeting is being recorded. Sorry about that. I clicked the wrong yeah. button. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, and um, from this experiment, unsurprisingly, I would say they found <laughs> that the oil movement in a case such as this is completely controlled by the ice. Because I mean, here you are at like, probably something like ninety percent ice cover, and Basically, all of these ice flows are touching, so there is no way that oil, this oil is going to move in any way different from what the ice does. Yeah. Um, just to kind of summarize what I think is the current state of the art in oil spill modeling, um, what, what do we actually know and what is actually implemented in oil spill models these days? So we know that when you have partial ice cover, then the oil um, is going to uh, more or less collect in the in the leads and the open water between uh, between ice. Uh, and this, of course, reduces the area that's available to the oil and it increases the thickness. And this, again, slows down processes like evaporation and water uptake that uh, are dependent on the interfacial area between uh, the oil and the ice in the atmosphere, or uh, on the water in the atmosphere. Uh, ice will also dampen the waves, which reduces entrainment of oil. And ice influences uh, transport. Uh, Amy mentioned this. You have something called the 3080 rule. Um, which says that if you are below 30% ice cover, then the oil moves as in open water. If you are above 80% ice cover, then the oil moves with the ice. And in between, you have something in between, uh, not specified too closely. Uh, I believe this was first described in a technical report, which I have been unable to find so far uh, from 1988, and then some other papers from around the same time by some of the same authors um, talk about this. 
but it, it's kind of based on a few observations of accidental oil spills as far as I know and it's uh, so it's not super well funded theoretically this stuff but it, but this is implemented in oil spill models nowadays uh, you can also get a lot of useful information from uh, coupled ice ocean models uh, things like ice coverage ice velocity water temperature and uh, the vertical eddy diffusivity in the water column uh, and all of these things are also used um, in oil spill models. Um, ice ocean models also predict a few other things, such as ice thickness, salinity, freezing rate, etc. And as far as I know, this isn't used by oil spill models, although I could be wrong. Um, and I guess things like freezing rate could be very useful because you could think about oil getting frozen into the ice and then being released at some later point then. So. Uh, anyway, useful information is available from ice ocean models, and it's important when you use these models to use consistent set of ice data and ocean data and so on. So I'll show an example of that. Um, this uh, shows a hypothetical release in the marginalized zone north of Norway. Uh, there is this, this gray square here, shows the release site. And um, on the left here, this is soon after the release, and this is a, bit, uh, a couple of days later. Uh, on the left, I have uh, used current and wind, but then I have used an ice velocity, which is estimated from the current and wind. Uh, and then what we see is that the oil, and the, the oil that's released, it kind of moves straight in through relatively high ice cover, which is contrary to what you'd expect. Uh, on the right, I have done the same simulation, but I have used an ice velocity that comes from the coupled ice ocean model. So uh, it's an ice velocity that is consistent with the currents and the wind. Uh, and in this case, you see that the... And, and additionally, in both of these cases, I've used this 3080 rule that I mentioned previously. Um, so in the two pictures on the on the right here, you see that uh, some days after the release, the oil still remains uh, kind of on the border between or in the, in the marginalized zone, basically. Uh, so this is just a hypothetical case, but at least it seems much more physically reasonable <laughs> uh, when you use a consistent set of data. <coughs> uh, this is another example of using uh, data from uh, a coupled ice ocean model. This um, top panel shows two different sets of density profiles from two different areas. Um, <coughs> so on the left, you have uh, the depth of the picnic line is at something like 40 to 50 meters. Uh, and here on the right, you have a picnic line that's at around 75 to 80 meters. Uh, and this is going to affect the vertical diffusivity, so the mixing, because uh, in the top here, where the density is constant, you have much higher vertical mixing than you have uh, once the density starts increasing. And if you use this as input to an oil spin model, uh, which is what we see at the bottom here, then uh, this affects how deep down uh, the oil gets mixed. So this is, uh, it's again, it's a hypothetical scenario where I've released really tiny oil droplets that mix quite quickly, but, uh, but you see the difference in using uh, using this information from an ice ocean model. So, <laughs> of course, you can ask, is this model going to be right? Um, that's an important part of the of the uncertainty, but at least that information is there, and um, yeah, it, it might be worth using it. <laughs> to mention some recent work we have done at Sintef, um, we had a project that ran uh, for three years, from 2016 to 2019, where we did a bunch of uh, experimental work in yeah, some flume work and some uh, other lab work, for example, on biodegradation. <laughs> Um, there are a couple of references here. Um, and we also looked a little bit at what happens when uh, there is, a, in this case, a current forcing oil on the surface towards an ice edge. Or well, I guess in this case, it's a, technically it's a polypropylene um, edge. But the, the point is that the oil kind of gets compressed um, when it's being pushed against the ice edge. And, yeah. Um, currently, we are testing some uh, model implementations of this thickness model and also some of the biodegradation data that was received from uh, or derived from this project. Uh, other recent work at Sintef is uh, an ongoing project that we have together with uh, the Institute of Marine Research in Norway, uh, Met Norway, University of Tromsø, Sintef, um, and international partners NOAA and University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, this is I think a quite interesting project. Um, University of Tromsø, we have um, sociologists who are talking about social questions and fisheries and yeah, things like this. Uh, then Met Norway runs an ensemble prediction system for uh, this area here where they um, look at 
uh, currents and CIs. And then Syntef uh, is going to run ensembles of oil spills on top of those ensembles of ocean data to get statistical predictions of what might happen. And then the Institute of Marine Research is going to run their model for uh, polar cod eggs and larvae to look at potential impacts um, of an oil spill. Yeah. Uh, to mention a couple of challenges that I see with improving uh, oil in ice modeling, um, Amy has already mentioned the scales. Uh, on the left here, we see a picture of sea ice. This is actually in the Antarctic, not the Arctic, but still. Um, there is things here going on down to meter scale and even smaller. Uh, and on the right, you see examples of uh, ice model data where you see uh, the ice edge here and uh, zoomed in on the ice edge here. And each of these squares are four by four kilometer and you don't know anything about what's happening on details smaller than that. Uh, so this is of course uh, a challenge. Another challenge is that uh, when you start looking at what's happening with um, ice and waves, it starts to get quite complicated because the ice will dampen uh, the waves and how much and how fast depends on the thickness and the type of ice and uh, all kinds of things. And then you can start asking questions about what happens really when you have oil <laughs> in or near the marginal ice zone if you have large waves. Is there going to be entrainment of the oil? What is the droplet size distribution going to be? And is the oil going to be pushed underneath the ice? And if so, how far? No. All right. Um, yeah, at the end, um, this is my uh, second to last slide. Uh, I just want to say many thanks to Climate Change and Environment Canada, um, who might have actually found me a copy of this uh, report that I mentioned from 1988. At least they've given me a link to a catalog record in their library. So hopefully I can get somebody to scan this for me. Um, yeah, so many thanks to them. And uh, I guess we have 30 seconds maybe for a question if somebody uh, if somebody has a question. Otherwise, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions later if you contact me by email or uh, yeah, anything. Yeah, perfect, perfect, sir. Thank you, mm -hmm. thank you very much. This was really, really nice, a very interesting presentation, a very nice compliment too to Amy's presentation. Um, I know that the all the R IARPIC people have a hard a deadline at the at the top of the hour, uh, so I do am afraid that we have to uh, to cut it off here. Mm -hmm. um, so all this presentation, the presentation, the the recording of the presentation will be posted on the IARPIC website and also the slides. And um, I'm really sorry that we haven't had more time for uh, for discussion, uh, because this was really really interesting. I thought and uh, very relevant uh, for the for this community. I mean, I think this is really uh, really good work. Um, so with that, uh, Hazel, do you want to um, close this off? Um, sure. I, well, apologies to her for stopping the recording halfway through. <laughs> That's I was good. trying to open the chat. Um, I'm actually happy to stay on. I know that the team leaders have another meeting right after this, but I can keep the room open for five minutes if uh, I don't know if Tor or Amy are available or interested. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so I'm happy to do that. And then um, I know the modeling team has a related meeting coming up. I believe it's February 23rd. Um, and That's right. Yeah. It will be on um, uh, for the atmosphere. We'll be looking at atmospheric composition forecasting with the GOCF model. So that, that should be an interesting one. And I don't know if the post team wants to announce an upcoming meeting. Um, and otherwise, you can you know, stay stay tuned on the IRPEC website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm still working on that uh, to put together a meeting about other marine debris um, work. Um, I'm in contact with Peter uh, Webster about that. So I'm really excited about that and stay tuned for, uh, for information about that. Thank you. Great, well, thank you all so much. And yeah, again, the meeting recording will be posted uh, shortly on the IRPEC website and on YouTube, so. Um, feel free to share that around. Um, will you be able to capture the chat as well? Because it'd be kind of nice to have some of those questions and answers written down. Yes, I, I will capture that and put it in the meeting notes. Um, and when you close out, I don't know if that happens if you're not the host, um, but often it, it will save the chat on your computer. That may just be a host feature. Okay, uh, I can see, see with the Hazel. The click the uh, chat bottom, like the right hand side, the click the three dot dot dot, save chat, then you can save it. Okay, yeah, perfect. So yeah, 
but I'll make sure all of the, the chats are Q and A are captured in the notes. All right, great. Well, uh, thank you very much. I have to, uh, to step off too. So thanks everybody. I really appreciate the very interesting session. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for inviting Thank us. you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invitation.